Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Best Practice Site Architecture in Drupal 8, How to Make the Right Decisions for Your Development Plan. Your speakers for today are Matt Chaney, co-founder here at Pantheon, along with our guest speaker, Mark Furry, Director of Engineering at Chapter 3. Just a few housekeeping items to go over before we start. Please make sure you submit any questions you have during the presentation in the question window, or tweet them at Get Pantheon. We will answer as many of the questions as we can during the Q&A portion of today's presentation. Also, this webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be made available to everyone next week. I'd now like to turn it over to Matt and Mark. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is Matt Cheney. I'm uh, one of the co-founders here at Pantheon, and I've been doing web development for the last 10 years. Very excited about Drupal 8, of course, and all the new opportunities it provides us, and I'm excited to talk about some tips and tricks for using Drupal 8 and building really awesome site architecture here with Mark today. Hi, I'm uh, Mark Free. I'm the Director of Engineering at Chapter 3. I've uh, been building Drupal sites for a really long time, and now I oversee all of our Drupal projects and help with the architecture side of things in particular. And uh, we both um, you know, are pretty knowledgeable about web development and Drupal 8 specifically, and so we're going to reserve a lot of the time uh, or reserve some time here for a Q&A at the end. So we have a chat uh, window where you can pop up questions and we'll sort of save, the, save some for the end. We can answer some in line. But, you know, everyone's sort of still figuring this out, that Drupal 8 is, I think, sort of having the dawning of its, of its glory age. We've been out with over a year of Drupal 8. We now have 168,000 sites sort of using it in the wild. Uh, which is a significant increase over a year ago this time, about a, a three times increase. And, you know, both Mark and myself have spent a lot of time through Chapter 3 and Pantheon working with, uh, with Drupal 8 and seeing a lot of the different projects that have come through. You know, as Mark said, he's, you know, they had him do a lot of Drupal 8 development at Chapter 3, all of their new projects running on Drupal 8, uh, and have a lot of experience with that. And here at Pantheon, sort of since the beta, we've been hosting Drupal 8 on our platform, and uh, over 20,000 people have sort of spun up Drupal 8 sites and, and tried out the, the different technologies. And I think that like, people have been met with like, a mix of success uh, in terms of you know, building really awesome stuff to struggling, and I think a lot of sort of what we're trying to do in this webinar and across a lot of sort of education in the community is get people sort of aware of what Drupal 8 is good for, what kind of things it can be used to be really excellent to do and where, where some of the pitfalls are. So I think when I think about Drupal 8, I really am trying to think about it sort of on its own terms. That I think Drupal 8 is absolutely ready for production, has been so for a long time, and that you know, everyone should feel confident building sites on it today. That this is something that you know, we see a lot, of, a lot of successful outcomes when people use Drupal 8. But I think the biggest switch, and if you're sort of going to take one thing away from this webinar, I think this is maybe, maybe it which is that unlike Drupal 7 or Drupal 6, where if you had a sort of need for something, you would sort of you know, try to find a quote module for that, um, that isn't necessarily going to be a case in Drupal 8. Um, that there's a lot of things in Drupal 8 that you, know, you don't need modules for because the core system is actually far more powerful than it's ever been before, and you can do a lot of things just in the Drupal core. Um, David Strauss, uh, our CTO here at Pantheon, and myself had a talk at uh, last year's DrupalCon on Agile D8 builds, where we actually build a whole lot of really complicated sites just using core Drupal 8 uh, technology. So you don't need modules in that case. You also, in the case of Drupal 8, like because of the more advanced Twig sort of templating system, you end up not needing as many sort of helper modules to build little slideshow features or little widgets on your page that you can do a lot of that just in the theme. So you're not actually extending other, other kinds of code. And I think that that's, that's good, that part of the architecture of Drupal 8 means that like with very small amounts of code, uh, you can develop routes or do complicated templating, and you don't necessarily need a lot of modules uh, to get things done. And, and that a lot of what we'll... That you're just going to be happier using core. Like uh, people, people are struggling to figure out these Drupal 8 design patterns and their contrib modules, and sometimes contrib code is a little bit rough. And if you're using core, that code's already been, you know, put through its paces for a couple of years now. So you'll, you'll be much happier if you use if use core as much as you can. Yeah, 
And I think that's, from the successful projects we've seen, that's really been the philosophy. And that would be the one I would sort of emphasize, Mark and I would emphasize today. And I think, you know, sort of, in that case, like Drupal 8's core features, specifically its content management features, are absolutely ace. That you can model content, create custom block types, build really complicated entities um, in ways that, like, you were never able to do before and can really model any kind of content that you're sort of trying to produce on the web. And sort of add to that this sort of templating system where you can, you know, easily sort of export out individual elements of that content. And you have a lot of power right there in the Drupal 8 core system. And I think when we think about architecting Drupal 8 sites, the way, and we'll talk, we're going to run through a development plan, show off some, some example sites in a minute. But a lot of the sort of thinking is, if you can just get the content model right, and you can get the page model right, and you can sort of start to define it that way, that's 80% of the work you need to do. You can do almost all of that in core. And then, yeah, you'll fill the edges with some custom code to do the architecture. But getting that core content management piece right saves you all sorts of time. And I think that's when I think about Drupal 8 sort of architecture. I just wanted to start there for the webinar in terms of thinking about it. Um, so with that, I'll throw it over to Mark to sort of talk about some of the ideas and some best practices and some sort of user stories about how to use, how to use Drupal 8. So um, anybody here who's tried to use Drush Make in Drupal 7 probably you know, feels like this guy. Um, you know, Drush Make was a Drupal-specific tool to solve a, a problem that you know, was definitely there. And you know, we didn't have the luxury of using any other tools to accomplish those kind of tasks in, in Drupal 7. So uh, next slide. Um, the PHP community um, has finally developed a package manager that people actually want to use with Composer. And with Drupal 8, the whole system is built around Composer. Um, core is built using Composer. And so um, what people have realized is that the more you rely on Composer for your builds, um, the easier these things are, the more reproducible these things are. And so there's a tool out there called Composer Patch Manager that, for me, does all of the important parts, that combined with Composer, does all of the important parts of Drush Make which is I can manage patches. And like I said, you know, V8 contrib code might be a little bit rough, so you are going to be managing patches. I would say that this has increased, decreased greatly over the last year. Like at the beginning of 2016, Chapter 3 decided we're going to build all our new projects in Drupal 8. And the number of patches we have to maintain has definitely decreased over that year. So I, th I think contrib is getting more and more solid every day. And people are actively committing these patches, but you're still going to have rough patches and this gives you a really easy tool that to manage those patches and so you know, don't be afraid to use Composer and don't be afraid to you know build your Drupal 8 project using Composer especially while you're in the development phase of the project. Yeah I would definitely echo that I think from an architecture standpoint making sure you've got all the required code not only from Drupal core and contrib but external PHP libraries I think those are important parts of building really good projects is to have the most up-to-date kind of stuff all together. Composer really lets you put it together. And by using the patches stuff to increase, you can do basically everything you did in Drush Make, but better. So switching the role to the site owner, um, uh, I, I've gotten this request a bunch of times from different types of clients. Um, in a certain industries, they really don't want you to be able to change production and the way production works, or to be able to bring down production from the admin UI. So um, in Drupal 7, I didn't really have a good solution to this other than rewriting people's password hashes when we move the database up to prod. Um, but Drupal 8, with configuration management, um, we get a much better solution. So um, config read only is uh, it, it's part of a class of modules that I've been really excited to watch for Drupal 8. So um, you know, if you go looking for that same D7 contrib module that you've always used, you may not find it or you may not be happy with the state it's in. But if you go look for a D8 specific module, you can find some really awesome things that um, are only available because of, you know, the power behind Drupal 8. So with configuration management, just to do a little recap of that, like every piece of config, every checkbox you check in Drupal is now captured in YAML files. And so what that means is I now have to, during my architecture phase, think about how I'm going to be managing that config. 
come up with a system like is it going to be contribute is it going to be committed to the git repo or are we going to um, you know store it somewhere else so it's read and write or in this case are we going to lock it down so that um, when I click a checkbox on production I get this nice message that says this form can't be saved because configuration is read only and so what that means is the only way I'm going to be able to make a change to production is moving code up to production which you know in the right type of industry the right type of environment that can be hugely powerful and um, it also for me like managing client expectations is a big part of my job and when you see a message instead of just making that change and then having it overwritten the next time code gets deployed from stage um, I, I would say most of the DA projects we work on we're overwriting production config every time we deploy to production and so that means um, if you don't have a module like this in place, you're merging changes, you're sending emails to people asking them, did you mean to change the title of that view or was that an accident? So I would say um, you, need a, you need a config strategy and that should be planned really early in the project and like all of the developers involved in the project should be sitting in on that to agree on that config strategy. Yeah, I definitely plus one this approach. I think it forces you on an architectural level to get your config right early on and doesn't allow you to sort of like cheat by like changing it quickly on the live environment. That this is a sort of disciplined approach to development. And all it takes is one little module and a settings.php uh, uh, flag and you're good to go. So I, I think one of the features of Drupal 8 that kind of flown below the radar is the improved testing in Drupal 8. Um, anybody that tried to write tests in Drupal 7 got a little frustrated, but in Drupal 8, like writing tests is much easier. The core test coverage is huge, like far greater than we've ever had in Drupal. And um, the, the new ability we have, which is actually really recent, I think of as of 8.1, is the ability to write JavaScript tests um, just using PHP, which I know sounds weird, but if you look at the next slide, you can see the example. It's not as weird as it sounds. And so what you're doing is it's something that looks a lot like the hat, but it actually allows you to change the JavaScript behavior of the page. So in, in this example, we're setting ses sessions and we're testing sessions, but um, you can also do Ajax calls from this kind of code. So what it means is you're writing the same kind of test no matter what you're interacting with. And as, as a person writing tests, I need to worry less about what's going to work and more about the behavior of the page and what I expect, which is what you should be really doing when you're writing tests is, you know, testing behavior, testing functionality, not worrying about like working around some crazy core subsystem and how it functions to write your test and make your test function properly. And so I would say writing tests for D8 is far, far easier than it ever has been in Drupal. Yeah, I think like one of the things we see a lot at Pantheon is working with different agencies. There are much more interested in writing tests for their software now than ever before. And that this is something that I think the, you know, making them really complicated becomes difficult because you have to spend time and energy to develop the task that comes out of your project budget. And, you know, if you can't see the ROI immediately, it's sort of hard. But if you're able to have, you know, really easy to write tests, stuff like this, that can, you know, quickly test all sorts of functionality in your site, you can run that, you know, on every code commit, on every deploy and get a lot of value quickly. And I think it's awesome to see Drupal 8 making that even easier for JavaScript as well. So jumping away from the, you know, the other roles, going to the themer role, I feel like themers are, are getting you know, huge benefits and what's changed about the theme layer in Drupal 8. And so this is a super common request. I get it on almost every project. It, you know, but sometimes it's not even as simple as this description. It's like only on a few pages, except these ones and these situations. And so um, with Twig, instead of having to, you know, respond to that request in the UI, like putting in a tool that allows you to, you know, change template behavior on demand, you can also manage this in templates really quickly and easily. Um, so if you look at the next slide, I got some code examples from uh, using, oh, so we got a screenshot first. And so, you know, this just explains, you know, when you might need to use this. You know, on a 404 page, I want to show as little as possible because I might be serving up a lot of those. So for, for performance reasons, I'm just going to drop the sidebar, the header, and maybe even the footer. So um, on the next slide, we get an intro to Twig blocks. So Twig blocks are an inherent 
instance system for Twig templates. There are actually multiple systems in place. Um, I've actually got a developer working on a blog post right now to try to explain all the different Twig inheritance systems, but blocks are the most simple and straightforward. And I, th I think really everyone writing V8 themes is going to learn to love them and start using them heavily. Um, if you look at the next slide, the code makes it simpler than the description. So this, this is the, the 404 page. So I extend my normal page template, the one I use on everywhere in the site, and all I do is return an empty block for the sidebar. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that this is what the sidebar would normally contain, and this is what it contains in the parent template. And all I had to do to drop all of that is just return that empty block. And so in some cases, I might be returning something very different, like a very different style of sidebar. But if, if there's something that only needs to display on certain pages, just returning an empty twig block means I'm, I, I can use inheritance where I want it and override it where I need to and do that in a really fine-grained way. Like a, a lot of the templates I looked at to find examples had like six or seven different blocks set aside, you know, for different important areas of the page. Um, one of the themers I was talking to about this described it as a kind of a replacement for regions. You really don't even need to think about regions anymore because you can have like a well-designed block system that replaces that. Yeah, and this I think really is gonna, you know, it really speeds up a lot of the development projects that does happen um, using using Drupal 8. It makes the code to actually do it a lot simpler. That you know, sort of these two examples that are being shortened, like this is easy to understand, doesn't require a lot of Drupalisms and a lot of weird things to make work. It's sort of very readable, very understandable, very hackable, which I think is a nice, nice feature to it, and one that Drupal has done very well with. So sort of on that line of, of making architecture pleasurable, and uh, definitely need a Zara Hardy Hadid slide in here since we are talking about architecture, is that you know, sort of a lot of what we're trying to do when we're architecting Drupal 8 sites is you know, make the right decisions for actually building the sites and then build it in the right way. And there's a lot going on here. I mean, architecture for Drupal 8 you know, is, is in some cases weeks of project time to get right. But I think you know, we're trying to highlight some of the high level kind of things that people are truly interested in sort of improving. And I think one area that you know, is gonna be on top of all of our minds is how to sort of interact with the contrib space in Drupal 8. That you know, when you're doing an architecture plan, you're thinking about you know, what features can we build and sort of in what way can we build them. And I think for those who have been doing Drupal for a while, turning to contrib is something that is very natural and has been very helpful. And that's something that I think, you know, we talked a little about this earlier um, where Mark and I were sort of sharing that not every, you know, feature needs its own contrib module. You can do a lot in core, and I think that's right. But I think also sort of when you're thinking about it, you are going to need to use some contrib uh, as part of your projects. And I think that sort of, you know, after a year of Drupal 8 being out, obviously a lot of, of stuff has been updated in contrib. But I would share... Uh, I'm sure Mark would agree that like there's the consistency of sort of what is, you know, the quality, it can vary a lot and not necessarily in a way that tracks its official sort of release, release schedule. That sometimes a dev branch with no release is a better Drupal 8 sort of contribution than something that has a 1.0 release. And so one of the things that I find really helpful is when you're sort of doing an architecture plan to try to like identify the areas where custom code is definitely going to be needed. And when that happens, turn around and basically say, okay, you know, is this something I can do in core custom code or is this something that needs a contrib module? And if it needs a contrib module, I think sort of the way that, you know, Mark and I were talking for, for the webinar is look at the contrib module, care maybe a little bit about the release of it, how many people are using it. But one thing to really dive into is look at the code for the release module, for the module and see how much sort of Drupal 8 site, ar Drupal 8 architecture is used in the module. Are they using a lot of, you know, Drupal 8 patterns? Does it look like code that's more consistent with Drupal 8? And that's something that I think if, um, if, if you see a lot of Drupal 8 isms in the code, I think there's a lot of confidence that's going to be a good sort of integration into your stuff. Sometimes you'll see things that work in Drupal, Drupal 8, but they're sort of, just sort of have wrappers around Drupal 8 stuff and still maintain a lot of other legacy Drupal 7 code. Those can still work, of course. But I think the more Drupal 8 native the module is, the stronger it is. And I think in an architecture perspective, finding those kind of things 
than doing quick little spikes in your development pl planning to see if stuff works. Uh, definitely gives you more truth, beauty, and wisdom. One strategy that I use there as well is looking at the author of the module and clicking through their profile and looking if they have core commits because um, working on core is the best way to learn these patterns. A core is really defining these patterns. And so if, if, if somebody has done a lot of work in core and then cranks out a module or cranks out a release for a module, you can rely on that being, you know, following Drupal 8 design patterns well and, you know, using the right core APIs. And, and so I think that I'm paying more attention to the name of the person that's done the most recent work than I used to in Drupal 7. Yeah. Very, very important. Um, of course, once you actually get into a situation where you're trying to use modules and sort of figure out what's good, I think you're going to end up needing doing a little bit of debugging. Um, and this is something that this isn't truly like an architectural kind of challenge, but I think one thing that anyone who sort of does a lot of architecture will tell you is that you do need to do a lot of testing of stuff when you're sort of going through the architectural planning. So like thinking through, you know, what contrib modules to use, you need to start to try to test and debug them. Or if you're working on custom code, figuring out how to like get stuff to work. And so the, um, you know, sort of just quick sort of tip I would throw out there is that actually Drupal out of the box doesn't shift, doesn't ship with any sort of development stuff turned on. You know, you, you have caching turned on by default, you have CSS and JavaScript aggregation by default, you don't have the the uh, development services YAML stuff included by default. Twig doesn't exist uh, by default uh, in the debugging mode. And so you have to turn all of these things on. And this is stuff that I think just, you know, some people struggle with and they're sort of starting out with a Drupal 8 project. Hey, how do I see the errors? How do I see the right debugging stuff? Putting all this stuff is the way to do it. And if this is something sort of just uh, sort of as a shout out, um, Zakia over at Chapter 3 is doing a presentation uh, at DrupalCon Baltimore, 15 ways to debug Drupal 8 for front-enders that I think will help help you really sort of figure out a lot of these kind of, of best practices. Um, and that part of good architecture is making good choices and figuring out good choices requires some, some debugging. Um, and that's also true sort of not only on the front-end um, kind of level with Twig, but also on the back-end where figuring out sort of, you know, what route goes to what uh, piece of code. That, you know, if you're trying to sort of say how, how, I'm looking at a contrib module, how does this work? I want to figure out sort of what this, what path corresponds to what sort of executable code. In like, you know, previous worlds, you might like look at like, you know, menu hooks and try to figure out what the arrays map to. Drupal 8's a little more complicated, of course. And so one tool that I find really helpful is uh, using the uh, Drupal console uh, application. It's a really great tool that'll list out a bunch of routes for you by doing Drupal router debug. And it'll show you every single route in the system and what code is actually being executed. And that's a good way to sort of, you know, quickly, quickly dive in and figure out, figure out what's going on. I, I would add that uh, one nice thing about routes is that it's terminology that every other framework, including front end frameworks uses. Um, and so once you start thinking about things as routes, and you know, learning that aspect of Symphony, um, you know, it, it helps you in other systems as well. So, it, so it's it's not Drupal specific knowledge. It's not a Drupalism, you know, like you're saying the menu hooks. And so, um, it, it's um, every backend DA developer you talk to is going to talk about routes all the time. Like it's going to come up in discussions all the time. But you know, luckily, it's you know more broadly used knowledge that that you're gaining by thinking about things this way. True story. Um, on the Twig debugging side of things, uh, we sort of showed you before how to sort of turn it on. I think, as I said, you can do a lot of architecture in Drupal 8 sites just through the, the theme template. There's a lot of flexibility to sort of customize different areas of the site uh, and different kinds of things. But figuring out what, what overrides what and what templates you should use can certainly be a challenge. Turning on debug mode in Twig gives us this kind of breakdown where you can see individual areas where this is the file name you would have to write to override this piece, or this is where you can actually see the core, core template that's being used and stuff like that. And that makes this kind of, of work really, really easy. It's even easier to um, uh, shout out to Arshad who has this really awesome Chrome uh, template sort of helper where you turn on this in, in Google Chrome, it'll actually show you where individually like in the code where uh, what, what template suggestions are for which things, and then you can copy them directly uh, and then put them into your own custom files. 
and this is something that actually works really well um, to actually figure out how to how to sort of create the right sort of front end architecture by finding what templates need to be overridden to actually build the sort of uh, site of your dreams. A uh, couple other just little, uh, you know, one other just debugging tip I just threw in there was um, one of the things when I'm sort of doing little spikes to figure out what stuff's good for architecture is I'll actually use uh, the Drupal Watchdog, which exists in Drupal 8. Uh, just requires you to use uh, sort of a slightly different syntax to log stuff to the watchdog, but you can use that to actually get information um, and and sort of see what's going on. And I think that's helpful. Like you got a lot of stuff in Drupal 8 is new. A lot of things you're sort of trying out and experimenting. I think that's an important part of site architecture, and having good debugging techniques makes a lot of sense. So shifting gears a bit, to sort of talking about sort of the admin architecture. I think. One of the things that can get overlooked in a lot of projects that, that might happen is sort of what actually needs to be architected on the back end. What user stories are you going to meet for administration? And what is that going to sort of look and feel like? That um, one of the things that we've sort of seen uh, is that over the years, Drupal has gotten a lot better on the back end, which is excellent. And a lot of the things that maybe previously you had to do development work to do, like figuring out you know, how to set up a WYSIWYG or building sort of a, a nice admin menu or or, or using views to actually manage administration of content. Those are all now in core, so you don't have to do as much. But I think you still want to sort of think through what what are your sort of like you know architecture challenges for the back end. You know what kind of you know workflow operations need to actually be determined for uh, for the content that's going through. What sort of dashboards need to be built for individual use cases. You know, and what kind of custom design needs to happen for those administration experiences. And I think, you know, for the sort of architecture plans that I, that I work on and see, you know, having a section for admin and thinking very critically about that can really mean the difference between a project that gets used a lot by the end users and the, people, the site owners that use it or one that doesn't actually get used as much. And I think Drupal is so powerful for the end user to change, you know, to manage their content that just, you know, some small amounts of views and, it, you know, dashboard configuration can go a really long way. Um, and that's something I think that can make a lot of sense from an architecture plan to really plan for that and make sure that stuff works really well. And, and I would say just from a client management perspective, teasing out the types of administrators that are going to be using the system is sometimes more difficult than like learning about the, you know, front end users, like the anonymous users. So, you know, you really have to ask a lot of hard questions about you know, who's logging in, what permissions do they have? What type of things do they edit? Like, what kind of time do they have to actually work in the CMS to like answer these like admin questions? Yeah. Um, I also think uh, you know, sort of page layout as architecture is something to really think about. Uh, we'll, we can talk a little bit uh, in the Q and A maybe about sort of panels and, and page layout, but I think you know, regardless of the specific technical solution you need to do. I think sort of figuring out what kinds of like layouts are going to be used and how you're going to build those is a really important part of site architecture. You know, a lot of a lot of Drupal Drupal sites that I see can, that can get a little bit overly complicated is one where they sort of, you know, maybe started with a certain set of templates or layouts and then sort of tried to hack around those to like build more complicated things and then tried to like change those up to do other kind of complicated things. And you can really spend a lot of a lot of time wor working and sort of reworking those kind of layouts. And I think if you can nail your templates down from the beginning and get a sort of really consistent model for how each all the theme is going to be organized, things are so much easier to do down the road and so much easier to sort of change around. And that, you know, well, this might just sort of seem like, oh, it's just what the front enders do to implement some designs. I think it's more figuring out what kind of breakdown is going to exist and there's real architecture work that has to happen there. Because um, asking people to sort of you know change stuff around willy nilly can be really difficult and can affect sort of the, the outcome in a meaningful way. But having a consistent plan where it's like these are the templates we're going to have. Here's how our content's going to fit and our widgets are going to fit into that kind of template can really save you a lot of time and also make for a more sort of sustainable and long term project that people are going to use um, uh, on the long run, which is great. And, and I would add consistency. I mean Matt Matt said it a lot there, but Consistency is the key. It's, it's pick a system and stick with it, and stick with it not just after the site's built, but you know after it's built and you're maintaining it. You know, don't 
add display suite in like while the site is in maintenance like you know in addition to panels if you didn't have display suite there from the beginning because then it's going to be a little bit of an anti-pattern when you find it in the site because it's only going to be used in one small area so you know try, just pick an approach get everybody buy-in from everybody on that approach and make sure that if that same approach is used consistently you know you're not solving one problem with one tool in one section of the site and another tool in another section of the site True story. All right. So that, I mean, those are sort of some high-level tips we were sort of having about architecture. There's obviously a lot to sort of go in on that. But I think one of the things we wanted to sort of turn our attention to is sort of just do a few little snippets of how do you build stuff in Drupal 8. These are some screenshots of some uh, of some sites that sort of Mark and I have, have looked at and, you know, sort of to give a little bit of sort of opinions from both of us on how would you actually create that sort of in Drupal 8. So the first one I'll sort of throw out there, and I can maybe put Mark on the spot and ask him how this would get built, is uh, this is just a little uh, you know, sort of outlining of some organizations. We got some image, got some text, and it sort of maybe lives on a page uh, on the website. Um, this is something you would obviously need to create an architecture around. Uh, Mark, how would you build something like this? So, so this particular example, I actually know how it's built. So it's, it's built with views and entity queue to order things. Um, so NADQ is one of those like modules written by a core dev like in its D8 version so you can really rely on that working. So it might as well be core. And um, then you, uh, the, one, the one thing I would advise is if you're taking over a site is um, a lot of references have, and because we have a really good content model in D8, um, what looks like a view might actually be a reference field. So like don't don't assume that it's a view just because it looks like a view on the front end. Like a lot of times you need to go into the content type to like actually ensure that it's a view. Yeah, that's a, a pretty good point. But sort of the power of entities here is definitely going to be a theme um, for actually building building all of this stuff, as well as the ability to sort of choose different kinds of directions to get things done. I think one of the things Drupal has always been possible to do is be able to build things in multiple different ways. Not, they're not necessarily, one's not necessarily totally best, but there's variations. But I think from a site architecture perspective, consistency of design is really important. If you're going to use Entity Queue for this, use Entity Queue for other stuff as well on that same site, and you'll end up with a lot, a lot more consistent development practice um, and consistent ability to sort of, you know, work overall. Uh, next example is a little, a little more tricky. Um, this is something that, uh, you know, a little screenshot here of a sort of volunteer uh, sort of matching situation where we have uh, a number of different volunteers that are affiliated with a number of different universities and they may have this sort of like, you know, workflow process that happens where we're actually, you know, they express the interest, they then get matched with specific, you know, opportunities. Uh, and then they can get, you know, sort of approved uh, if those opportunities show, show, show sort of need around them. Um, and then they're going to get sort of listed, listed here. Um, and I think sort of, I can sort of start off, start off with this one, is that I think one of the sort of wins here is really to start to build out some, some custom entities that sort of reflect the different things that are going on. Um, that's one thing, if you haven't built custom entities in Drupal 8 or had a lot of experience with them, I think that's a good sort of afternoon learning project. Grab a session from the last DrupalCon and using custom entities, run through it and build a couple of your own. Because when we have things like a person that maybe has a set of arbitrary attributes and we have things like a, a volunteer opportunity that might have other attributes, that being able to like, you know, have each of them and then have those connect in, in sort of custom ways ends up being really powerful. And one of the great things about the entities is that because it's sort of this consistent data model in Drupal, sort of views module in core has the ability to sort of create lists of them based on criteria and that are exposed to them. And that's all in a pretty sort of consistent way. So you can build these kind of views where it's like, oh, we have like, you know, list of volunteers that are interested, current and past opportunities could be sort of two different lists. And those are all things, um, the volunteer roster that could be done in a, in a views context because you're using entities in a consistent way to sort of check it all up. Um, 
And that's something that I think, you know, that's a pattern you can apply to a lot of stuff in Drupal. And when things go beyond sort of what's easy to do in sort of just the UI, doing a little bit of custom entity work on top of that really can help you help you really build as sort of sky's the limit kind of complex data models. And I would add that DA projects end up with a lot of custom entities from what I've seen. Like they, it's um, it, D7, it, you had to use entity API along with the entity system to really get anything that was usable, whereas now that's all in core and then some. So entities are usable straight out of the gate and people are using them in creative ways. Um, the other thing sort of on that example that I sort of want to share is, um, and this is going to be different in Drupal 8.3, but when you actually have a workflow that's going to, you know, do different transitional states between entities, Drupal 8.3, there's sort of a new workflow entities and workflow system in the, uh, in the core, in the core that you can use. There's a workflow module today you can use to do a lot of this as well, but you basically can define multiple different workflows for each thing, so you can have a volunteer workflow, a volunteer organization workflow, and they have different transitions that can be just defined with different, you know, things that happen when those transitions work in. This is all pretty hookable and permissionable infrastructure, so it's pretty easy to get to get sort of what you need. But that building something like this, to implement a volunteer match system like that, uh, ends up being a pretty good plan. And with Drupal 8.3, you're able to do all of that uh, really easily. And I think that's a big win from a site architecture standpoint because you can reduce a lot of custom code, use a core system, and really sort of build whatever whatever you want to build as a uh, as a uh, developer. I, I would add that if you need this today, um, Workbench moderation is the solution that most T8 sites are using, and I've been promised an upgrade path um, to the core system. It, like the core system, really close is really closely modeled after Workbench moderation, so. If you already have an 8 site and you don't want to wait for 8.3 and you need moderation, um, I would use Workbench moderation because Chapter 3 is going to build an upgrade path if one doesn't get built by the community. Lovely to hear. Uh, next up is a little mobile uh, kind of screenshot. Uh, this is something that I think you know, obviously you're going to want to do significant planning on a mobile, for mobile sites for your, each website you build. And I think Drupal 8, you know, sort of was built with a lot of sort of mobile, mobile first, mobile involved kind of, of stuff involved. Um, I'm wondering, Mark, sort of what kind of tricks do you use to sort of architect mobile sites? Like are there some stuff you find in Drupal 8 that's been helpful to sort of, or patterns to use to, to really try to build stuff good for the cell phones? So, um, if, if you're doing your own, like, you know, using a front-end framework and, and doing your own layouts, like image handling is really difficult, and that's one thing that ships with core um, is, you know, the ability to do image variants for your different breakpoints. So I think that's, that's a huge one. Um, the one that shocked me and is, is a little terrifying is the number of clients that are using the um, mobile UI to add content, update content, work on their sites. So I would say if you're a module maintainer or you're writing custom code, don't assume that the admin isn't also going to be used on someone's phone because um, we, we've actually seen a lot of that, like a, a huge uptick in that because it's, it's fast and it's usable to use the admin on the phone. Yeah, that's a, I've definitely struggled a little bit with, with that when I'm on older sites. Um, and I think sort of planning that out in the architecture plan is, is good, you know, throwing in those, those user stories, thinking about that design, and I think it is sort of you know, building out a really good theme sort of turns into, you know, hey, let's, um, you know, let's think about how this is done in mobile, let's put the architecture up front and not sort of make it a sort of, you know, extended, hacked on version at the end, sort of as, as first class sort of kind of citizen in this whole thing. Yeah, a lot, a lot of our themers build sub-theme classy as well, so j just so you have a little bit of a starting point there. Um, and, and so anyway, that, that might be a good strategy. If, if you're the types or want to really hand make your own theme, um, classy at least gives you like a nice clear starting point. Yeah, 100 percent to check that out. Uh, next little 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 thing here is just a sort of uh, a sort of mega menu kind of functionality. These uh, obviously have gotten a little more popular over the years. Basically, we've got like four different uh, items where if you hover over them, there's a number of, of sub items that will link to something else. 
Um, and this is something that I think I, I can try to take a stab at this, but I'm sort of curious Mark's, Mark's opinion on it as well, is that there's a lot of ways you can kind of build this in, in Drupal. Um, I think you could probably take a menu system and sort of, you know, theme it in this kind of way. I think one of the things that Twig does really well is if you sort of can get, you know, the right, the right information sort of in there in a menu, you can throw that in and then actually theme, theme those item, items pretty easily. But another kind of development pattern that I think could also be used that's useful for this and other things are sort of custom uh, block types where, you know, blocks are def were, were definitely not like the most powerful thing in earlier versions of Drupal, but in Drupal 8, blocks are, are real entities. They can, are fieldable. They have like a lot of power to them. And you can create custom versions of them to have whatever kind of fields and content you want. And so you could create a sort of custom blo uh, block type here where you have a picture and a name for like what's on the title. You have like a, a multi-select link box for like, you know, title and links to go down. And then you have a view all link at the bottom. And you can create that as a really nice object within, within the, the Drupal CMS and then sort of, ex, sort of spit all of that kind of information out to a Twig template, which can then theme all of it sort of however you want. So you can get these really sort of complicated kind of looking designs, but still have the flexibility in the back end to sort of change, edit, and improve it as well. Um, and that could be, I think, a, a potential way to build this kind of, this kind of thing. Um, which I think, I think is pretty good. Uh, so last example we've got here before Mark sort of runs us through a development plan, uh, sorry, for sure plan for a Drupal 8 site. It's just, uh, you know, how would I build something like this in Drupal 8? Um, which from sort of an initial perspective, I think, uh, you know, hey, we got like some text and a button, no problem, right? But I think one of the things that, you know, the button implies is if we're making a payment you know, that's probably going to like lead us into some e-commerce kind of uh, kind of situation. And so I'm wondering maybe Mark, your sort of opinions on if you're asked to do e-commerce in Drupal 8, like what, what's your thinking around it? What kind of architectural decisions do you make? How, how would you or chapter, chapter, and chapter 3 do e-commerce for Drupal 8? So for me, the first question I ask is like, is this the only occurrence of payment or am I going to have it in a dozen other places throughout the site? And if this is the only occurrence, the question is, do we really want to maintain that technical debt of like our own commerce system or do we want to, you know, use a SaaS provider or a, some drop-in solution that like doesn't really tightly integrate with Drupal, but that's, you know, that's by design. That's to avoid maintaining, you know, commerce code as part of our Drupal site. So I think that's really the first question you should ask is, what kind of commerce experience am I expecting? Like, is that going to be highly customized and highly integrated with Drupal, or is it really kind of standalone? And, you know, if it's standalone, like, can I use a SaaS product, you know, like Shopify or something like that? You know, Stripe is really nice as well to, you know, solve that problem, you know, by paying somebody else 25 bucks a month instead of me maintain, spending far more than that maintaining, you know, a custom commerce solution. Yeah, I would I would totally agree with that as well. I mean, I think you can build an e-commerce site in Drupal 8 if, you, if, that's, if that is sort of your deal and you have a lot of content and other management stuff. But I think, you know, getting sucked into doing too much of it can definitely be a, be a little bit of a, a trubs. Um, so, yeah, so those are just some ideas of some stuff that uh, we sort of, you know, thought were sort of cool. How do you build it in Drupal 8? I think one of the things that might be helpful is Mark obviously does a lot of Drupal 8 architecture and development, you know, and sort of have him show off a, a sort of development plan that, that he uses uh, to actually build a site. Sort of talk us through, hey, you're trying to produce a, a site architecture plan. What does that look like and how does that work? So I'm, I'm going to run through this pretty quick so we have time for questions. But what, what I want to talk about more is why the type of questions we ask and why those need to be asked. and and kind of how that ties into Drupal 8. And so um, for me, Drupal 8 is really uh, tied to content. And by content, I mean edit entities. And so you really need to be thinking about, you know, your data structures and how those are named, what fields are where, and how that's, you know, dictated often by the design and strategy that's already happened before you're preparing one of these development plans. So um, our development plan, we try to use those as a one-stop shop so that whoever gets handed the site to develop it 
doesn't have to find any other documents. Like they can use this one as the jumping off point for everything. So um, the index shows, you know, we're talking a lot about data structures and everything else is kind of bolted on to the end. Um, you, want, you want to tell some assumptions about why the website exists. You want to find everything else that's been produced up to this point and document that well. Um, and so a lot of times this list is much shorter. Um, this is what comes out of a chapter three strategy session, but you know, you might, all you might have is mocks and that's okay. You just want to make sure that they're all linked to from this document. Um, you want to collect some goals about the project, um, you know, some assumptions about what's coming from the client versus what's being built. And, you know, if you still have open questions after strategy, like, you know, reiterate those here. Um, I think the interesting part in terms of DA architecture is, you know, this implementation plan. So this is going through exhaustively describing content types that are being created and how they're being created and how they reference each other is really what's interesting, I think, in a D8 project. So you see the reference fields here, um, those become really powerful and useful. And when you're defining custom entities, maybe it's not, not every entity is a full content type and you need to start thinking about smaller entities in your project. So each content type gets a full description, a full treatment of all the um, fields and why they're there and what, how those fields are going to be configured. This makes site building like much easier because you just plow through and then also someone can go in and QA against the dev plan to make sure the site building was done properly. So like if you spend the time doing it in a Word doc like this and working together, you know, maybe a themer and a back end dev are working on this together, you get to tease out any issues in the design right at the beginning instead of late, later on if you're doing it ad hoc. I'm going to scroll way down relevant to that last example we had. So as you can see, we've got a lot of content types. Some of them are way more complicated than others. The important part is just making sure you capture everything you can see in the design and describe how it's going to be implemented. So I think what's more interesting is this idea of slices. Um, you know, this is like a different approach than, you know, using something like panels for doing layout and content types. And it's really tied around the entity system. So you know, this description here, we kind of explains the chapter three approach to a lot of layouts, which is, you know, we're going to use entity construction kit or, you know, paragraph modules becoming more popular as it's becoming more robust and stable. Um, it, it, it accomplishes the same thing as these two tools. Um, and if you want to read a blog post comparing them, uh, Zaki has got a good one on our blog. But what these slices allow you to do is have reusable chunks and reordable chunks of content that, um, are their own data structure within the wider piece of content. And so these are reusable across different content types and they allow you to have really flexible layouts in this kind of popular, I would call it bootstrap style where everything is a long slice, um, everything is a full width and then it has its own mobile layouts as well. And so it's just as important to get these covered as it is for the parent content types and because these end up becoming the meat of the site and you get a lot of different styles as you can see scrolling down. And so as you can see, we've, get, we've got 15, 20 pages of just slice documentation. Taxonomies end up getting used a lot less heavily. As you can see, we only have one. That's kind of a D6 design pattern that people are moving away from, I would say. Uh, menus are also pretty simple. Uh, forms as well, roles. As you can see, it's not a complicated site until you're looking at all the different slices and the assumptions behind those slices. Um, we're going to have some multilingual considerations, but pretty straightforward. And so as you're identifying a slice solution or an entity solution, you need to make sure that multilingual handling is, is done well. Um, I would say that's a pr potential trap area. So watch, watch out for that. Um, front end workflow, we're just going to describe, which is kind of chapter three standard process and any special theming considerations. These might be departures from what you can see in the comps themselves. So that's pretty much it. Um, everything else is kind of standard boilerplate. Uh, very little custom development on the site. So really the content types is where all the interesting things and then the slices within the content types. That's where everything gets interesting. That's pretty much it for this guy. Yeah.
Yeah, no, thanks for sharing, Mark. I think that's definitely, um, you know, that's definitely a, you know, a sort of cool part of the project. I think, you know, one part from just a sort of thinking through, hey, we need to actually create a document. We need to start thinking through sort of how stuff's going to work. And I think to bring it sort of back to the where we started is that I think a lot of that was, let's define our content model, let's define our page model, and then let's sort of start filling and let's define our layout model and start building all that stuff in. I think you can get very far with Drupal 8 on that basis. All right, we have a few minutes to jump into questions here, so we'll get through as many as we can. Um, the first one was asked, uh, while on slide 15, the twig walk slide, um, where Mark, you had said, don't even really need to think about regions anymore. The question is in response to, what about panels? And she asked this question apprehensively. Yeah, I could I could just give a little a little piece and then let Mark handle it because he's probably built more stuff. But I was a big fan of panels in Drupal six and seven, and I'm still a big fan of a fan of it in Drupal eight. It's been a lot of work going into making it really excellent, and I think if you use it consistently, you can have a really good site architecture. Um, but Mark may have different opinions. And, and what, yeah, what I would say is I see there's kind of two camps in Drupal these days. Um, it's the you know paragraphs camp, which you know you might be using a different tool than paragraphs, but one with a different mindset. And then there's you know the the panels camp. And so what I would say is embrace the tool and learn everything you can about it, and see if your team can consistently use it. But don't mix and match. Like don't try to use paragraphs. ECK and panels on the same project because you're just going to cause yourself pain when you're trying to translate the content, if not like throughout the whole build. All right, next question. We're interested in the local development environment. MAMP versus Vagrant versus local Docker. Thoughts? Uh, what kind of local development do you use, uh, Mark? Um, I, I run Linux, so I, I, I app get installs things, but um, that's that's not really attainable for most people. Um, I, I love Docker. I, I think Docker is the wave of the future, and so um, if, if you can get a local dev stack running with Docker, um, the time you spend learning Docker and getting that set up is useful when you're debugging something on a server or you know, that kind of issue, but uh, Drupal VM seems to be the new popular choice around here with devs that don't want to deal with all the issues and learn it themselves. Yeah, I, I would say I use Calibox for development, which is a local Docker solution that um, allows you to sort of spin up, you know, PHP environments, Node environments, different kind of stuff, and integrates. Uh, I integrate with Pantheon and, and could integrate with other platforms pretty easily. Um, I think on the Drupal 8 context, like, you'll need a little more memory than maybe normal for certain kind of applications. And I think a lot of where I see Drupal 8 development going is sort of being part of a larger ecosystem of other kind of projects. And so a sort of a single map solution may not be appropriate because you may need to actually integrate with code and develop on code that's not just PHP. And I think having that flexibility for your environment is good. But um, you'll, you'll definitely yeah, I heard be able to find X to bug as well, which like may be limited by your tool. And so if, if you can't easily get X to bug up and running, like you're going to be frustrated doing Drupal 8 development, especially if you're doing back-end development. Yeah, for sure. All right, next question. Could you clarify custom entity? ECK, custom code, something else? All, all of the above. Like, the, um, just pick an approach and make sure it's consistent throughout the site. I mean, you, you, ECK seems to be the easiest barrier to entry, and it's well maintained. Yeah, could you, could you just expand on what ECK is for folks who might not be familiar, Mark? So it, it's Entity Construction Kit, um, that, you know, naming convention goes back to Content Construction Kit, which is, you know, the base for all these entities that we have in Drupal 8. Um, and so uh, what that allows you to do is you, you get a UI for building entities. You don't have to write that much custom code. If you want to, um, you might get inconsistencies in terms of, like, revision behavior and multilingual behavior with some of these tools. And so that's why we like using ECK, because we've been able to vet that behavior with ECK and, and sort of worked a lot of patches to make sure that that works well. Sounds good. All right. Uh, do you have a good recommendation for themers who are used to writing PHP slash TPL templates to uh, transition to Twig? Forget everything you know about PHP and realize you like are rarely going to use it anymore unless you want to start writing modules. 
Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Our next question is, do you guys recommend running Composer install only during project installation and commit the vendor directory on version control or build the project dependencies on every build and or deployment, including move to production? Um, yeah, I, I can handle this. So I definitely think that you should, you should, as part of your Composer workflow, you should end up with a build artifact at some point in the process. And I think that build artifact is the thing you actually want to run your tests on. So I don't think you should do a composer operation in production. I think you should do a composer operation before you sort of push it to a test environment and then use that build artifact to then push to a live environment. Just because composer, you know, if external services are down or other things aren't working correctly, you could get some inconsistent results and having consistency at build process is important. In a development context, I've seen it done a few different ways. I've seen some folks just use local and run composer local on their on their system and push that, push off the results to to uh, to 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 Git. I've seen other folks where they'll use some sort of continuous integration solution to do the build steps, to do SAS compilation, and to do composer. I think I'd honestly say I, uh, that there's I see people do it both ways and are successful. I don't think there's a, a sort of great consensus on that yet. If you're doing it locally, um, Mark, it's useful to have one person in charge, like, and so you just ping them in Slack to install a module for you, just so that like there aren't inconsistencies across environments and versions and things like that that happen sometimes with Composer. Yeah. All right. Next question is: Are you guys leveraging any Kickstart uh, distro such as Aquia Lightning? Yeah, I, I mean, I can break it for chapter three. We're not we're not using any distros for D8 dev. Um, yeah, I would say like the Aquia Lightning distribution is pretty great. Like it it does it it sort of gears more towards a sort of more of a sort of you know sort of a kickstart kind of thing. It's not going to do like out of the box. It isn't like a, a website. You still have to do a lot of distribution. But I think that having some stuff that if you're not familiar with using a lot of Drupal 8 development, starting off with something that sort of puts you a little a little higher up the stack is a good idea. And I think that, you know, distributions are a lot easier to build in Drupal 8, so I could see people having some additional, um, uh, having some processes like that to sort of help speed speed you up. But I think, you know, I would definitely make sure you at least understand from a starting point what Drupal 8 core gives you, and then maybe start playing around with some distributions to try speed up development. There's definitely some good ones out there like Aquia Lightning. Um, I'm just trying to squeeze in one or two more questions. The next one is a question for Matt. Um, is a full composer-based development workflow supported on Pantheon at this point? How does this play with Pantheon's upstream repo architecture? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. Um, currently, sort of, uh, in, in, the, in the Pantheon world, I think this is true for any site architecture world, you want to actually be able to figure out how you're going to run composer and how that's actually going to use external like uh, upstreams and other kind of things to build your site. And at, at present for Pantheon, we don't have a sort of definitive solution, in part because people do it a few different ways. I think the way we're sort of probably going to end up, and we'll have more to talk about this at DrupalCon in a few weeks, is that you can use an external repository like GitHub. You can store your Composer you know, manifest there, your SAS files there. And then you'll use a continuous integration solution like CircleCI to you know, take take those take that code, do the build step, and then push that up to a Pantheon sort of multi-dev or dev environment. And I think that sort of that sort of CI solution sort of becomes what Mark was talking about, where you have one person who's responsible for doing a lot of that work. I think we're sort of maybe switching to you have one robot responsible for that, and uh, that can be a good way to go. And that just helps to keep everything sort of sort of rolling along uh, in a consistent manner. Which I think is sort of a theme of a lot of the architecture stuff we're talking about in general is consistency across the board is really helpful. You'll save a lot of time that way. All right, we have one more question, um, and I think it's a good way to round it out and get an answer from both of you, and that is, what is the most striking thing in Drupal 8 for you? Huh. Um, I, I can maybe start off with mine. I think. The most striking thing for me, and I mentioned this a little earlier, is that just all of the things that you can do without using custom code or just using custom twig code. That if I'm thinking back to like the, you know, 
hundreds, maybe thousand websites I've like been involved in in my in my career. You many of those sites could have been built without without with very little if any custom code in Drupal 8 and I think that you know the sort of days of having a complicated site in Drupal 7 that had a hundred modules involved to make it all work uh, is, is sort of is, is gone that you know what's striking to me is that you can build a really complicated interesting site with using very little custom PHP code just doing configuration and templating and that's been I think that's really awesome for me, it's in the design patterns in CMI. Like we've been hearing about these in the Drupal community now for six, seven years, and seeing the payoff in terms of the types of contrib modules that are able to be produced and how quickly and easily a skilled DA developer can write a custom module. Like really, it, it's nice to see that payoff, and it really, you know, it takes a while of doing Drupal 8 development before you really see that payoff. All righty, guys. That's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions or feedback, please visit our website where you'll find a contact us page. Uh, and if you'll be in Baltimore for DrupalCon, you can catch Mark at the Chapter 3 booth and Matt Cheney at the Pantheon booth. I'm sure they would be more than happy to answer any additional D8 questions you all have. Have a great week, everyone. Bye-bye.